let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about? Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, the host of the show and a daughter whose mother lived with dementia for 30 years. I hope you enjoyed our opening music called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Dore. You can download that on any of your favorite music apps. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound news not just sound bites. We want to have real conversations and talk with real people at all levels and stages um, in terms of where they are on the journey or in terms of supporting others. I want to thank our listeners. You guys are so precious. Your likes, your clicks, your shares have really raised and elevated the work that we do all around the world. So I hope you'll continue to do that. And um, for those of you that don't know, November is National Caregivers Month, and it is also National Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Now, today we are going to be talking about The Wonders in Dementia Land, which is a book and a podcast, and is going to be going to the big screen. We have both the author of the book and the director of the film with us today, and I'll introduce them to you in just a moment. In the meantime, I want to just point out a couple of past shows that we did. We had uh, Winona, Minnesota on a dementia-friendly community talking about changing stigma and leveling that out by, by leveraging the arts in theater. And so we have a really fun conversation on there. We also had Jenworth on, and they talked about Care Scout which helps people who are working um, and caring for somebody, especially during COVID, um, cope. And you'll learn more about their program. Upcoming, we're going to have the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action on, and they are doing some really cool stuff with airport travel, not just locally here in Minnesota, but around the world. Now, a couple of shout outs. I love the Memory Cafe directory. If you're not familiar with it, you need to check it out. That's for uh, groups that involve both people living with dementia and their care partners to be able to get together. Um, I facilitate a couple of those, so I'm just going to give a shout out to those. Artist Senior Living in Woodbury, Minnesota has a Artist Way Cafe and we meet the third Wednesday of every month and we meet virtually from one to two and anybody around the world is welcome to, to join us. And then I also facilitate Arthur Senior Living has one called the Arthur's Memory Cafe and we meet the second and the fourth Wednesday of every month from one o'clock and in both of those times are central time. And again, virtually anybody can attend those and you can Find more information out about those by contacting me. I want to give a shout out to Dementia Action Alliance. They have two great new online programs. Both are free. One is for people living at home with dementia. The other is for people in assisted living. You can find out more information by going to their website at daanow.org. Coral Health, I got to give a shout out to them. They have some uh, great apps. Uh, one is Music First, the other is Coral Faith, and you can download both of those by going to coralhealth.com. That's C O R O health.com. And last, I want to just give a shout out to the Footbar Walker, but you know what? 
they put it in words better than I do. So let's take a listen and we'll be right back. The foot bar walker was designed not only to assist the patient, but also the caregiver. It's like having a portable pull bar everywhere you go. Patients have more control of their motion and pain management and no lifting from the caregiver is required. Caregivers, put your foot down and quit hurting your own health. No matter which side of the foot bar walker you're on, it's a win-win. Call 731-924-4444 and visit our factory showroom in Paris, Tennessee, or visit us online at thefootbarwalker.com. Well, hi, everyone. We are back, and I can't wait to introduce you to our guest today. First, I'm going to introduce you to Suska, uh, who was first on Alzheimer Speaks Radio back in March of 2017. I had to go look that up when I was absolutely fascinated by her book, Wonders in Dementia Land. And for the record, I am still a raving, raving fan of, of all of her work. Um, in 2017, a little bit later in June, I had the honor of actually meeting her out in California and what a little ball of positive energy. Um, and that was when I was a panelist on Maria Shriver's Move for the Minds event. And we just became kind of lifelong friends instantly. It was just uh, such a clicking of philosophies and personalities. It's, it's really been a joy to see her dreams kind of unfold. And so today we are gonna hear her story about caring for her mother who lived with dementia, how that changed her life and how many other lives she is changing as she's morphed from painter and artist to author, uh, to a really fun podcast and now making her way to the big screen. So welcome, Suska, how are you doing? I'm doing great, great, and great to see you, Laurie, again. Very fun to see you. This is, uh, this is gonna be exciting. I just, I can't wait for all the updates. We also have with us Radek Vinjan, who was born in Deskic, uh, Poland. He was raised in Poland, also the UK and Germany. And he is an alumni of the Film University and an international main media workshops, the college and documentary campus of the master's school. So he is, he is just extremely, extremely talented. He is a founding member of Magical Realist Films, which includes some tragic comedies such as Father, Son, and Holy Cow. And the theatrical documentaries um, he's done, one of them is called The School of Magic Mountain. And his most recent film, Miss Holocaust Survivor. Now, Radek is a storyteller in the tradition of magical realism. And I can't wait to hear more about that. And he has chosen to bring Suska's Wonders in Dementia Land to the big screen as his next adventure. And I can see why you grabbed a hold of that and what the attraction is, but welcome, Radek. Thank you very much, Laurie, and thank you for having me. Well, I'm gonna start with you first, Radek, because I always ask my guests if they have been personally touched by dementia in their own circle of friends or family. Well, as a matter of fact, I have, and you know, I don't want to elaborate too long about it, but it was my own grandmother. And um, at the end of her life, she had dementia, Al Alzheimer's actually, um, which I think is the most common form of dementia from what I've read. And uh, my last encounter with my grandmother was very, very touching because it was on Christmas and she died in January, in the middle of January, next, the next January. And she didn't know, uh, recognize much of what was going on around her, but the last time that I did say goodbye to her was when I sort of kissed her goodbye on Christmas Day, that was. And that was when she had a very clear moment. So I'm one of the very fortunate people to, you know, have had experience with dementia, uh, but a very, very positive one at the end. Sweet. I know that's mm -hmm. not everybody's story. And that is one of the, the goals of Suska. Um, and her and her tales of how she has dealt with it. And it's it's truly one of my passions as well. So Scott, can you just give our audience just a little background on, you know, when your mom had dementia and, you know, just your journey, sum it up kind of shortly, and then we'll dive more into uh, your book and um, your philosophies. 
Well, my mother um, got meningitis and cephalitis. So she was basically healthy and, and she got this and it took about six months that it actually went into rapid dementia. And um, I was living in California. She was living in Chicago. <clears throat> and I got that horrid call that I think every one in the world is afraid to get about their parents. And um, I got the call and that she fell. And so I left California, went there and um, it was diagnosed as dementia and I stayed for four years. Wow. It, it's interesting because most people think it'll be in and out. I'll just check in on it. Not a big deal. And then all of a sudden, whoop, all of life has changed. And uh, it's kind of amazing. So Scott, I, I want to talk about what dementia land is all about. You use that term. And, you know, how is it different from, uh, from our world? Wow. You know, it's so funny. I put that down as a question. And now that you ask it, I, I, I don't know where to go. It, to me, it, it, it's a word I created because I was absolutely amazed what was going on. Um, what happened was when I first moved in or uh, moved into my mom's house, I remember very much standing out there and going, okay, I, I have to make a decision here. And the decision was that I was going to I knew she was having trouble with her memory. I was going to drop my memory. I was going to drop who she is and walk in that house cold, like if I'm meeting her for the first time. So I kind of, when I did that, I also found out that I was taking a lot of pressure off of me of being the daughter I'm supposed to be or being a daughter, period, and just dropping all these other little armors that I was wearing. And when I walked in, I not only felt like I lost 10 pounds, but even her reaction to me was amazed me. She just was freer and lighter. She can live with this memoryless world or she can have all the difficulty she was having. She didn't feel like she was being judged by me or that she had to remember them because I'm in front of her. Something happened and it, it created this world, which I labeled as dementia land. And it was just letting go. It was absolutely letting go. And when you did that, there was a certain kind of enlightenment that was going on. There was a certain freeing that it, it absolutely surprised me to this day. I, I, I can't stop writing about it. I, it was wonderful. And that's what really, what I called my dementia land. Well, and it really is uh, this unconditional love and acceptance. I know like with my mom lived with it for 30 years. And I would say, um, as she progressed, she became the safest place for me to go because she didn't judge. And that was the gift you were given your mom. And I know how I reveled in that space. It was just like, oh my gosh. And it makes you realize, because I don't think we realize how much judge judgment we do. You know, my daughter will point it out to me, the, the, the role of the eyes or the you know, the, the big breath. And I don't even know what I'm doing it. She's like, my, you're doing it again. No, I'm not. But it's, you know, all of those things people with dementia still pick up on, you know, that it's that nonverbal is really the core of how we communicate and words just add to it and tone just adds to it. So to give her that kind of gift, because I feel like I received that is, it's just glorious. I mean, it's, it's like at a, you had mentioned the kind of a spiritual path. It, it is, it's, it's like undescribable because you're, you're just so in the zone with that person and you see things that you didn't see before you appreciate things and you realize life doesn't have to be complicated, right. which is really, really cool. So when you wrote the book, who were you writing the book for? Was it something that you needed to do for yourself or um, were you out to change the world? Well, of course I wasn't out to change the world, but it, it was a book that I, I wrote for myself because I couldn't find anything. You know, with this going on, especially the first couple of months, it's like, oh my God, you wanted to get some kind of information out there. And I didn't want to just get all the, the physical and the medical. I mean, that's fine, but it doesn't, it only, it's a small part of how I'm going to deal with this or how I feel about this or, 
or just trying to find someone who's on my side without the depression or without the, the, the horrible outcome that they made it always sound. So I started just doing little notes and writing and I had a million notes everywhere. So I basically wrote the book for myself, but it, it, it's, it's, kind of for, it's kind of for everyone. And it's not only just, and then it went from for myself or anybody who knows someone either living, a word I use living or living or they're near dementia land, meaning a, a relative that they don't always live with, but they visit often. And then it went to, you know, maybe this is, this is what we're living in right now. A little bit of dementia land, um, especially with the COVID and everything else that's going on in the United States. It's, it's a little bit, I think I read my book twice during this entire COVID thing because it's delightful and it opens up this other world. Could be a virtual reality of sorts, which is what we're entering now. So it's like the correlation. There's something about when you're letting go and you're, dry, and you're going into a whole different world. I call it dementia land. Some people today call it virtual reality. There's something here that I find, I, I just find interesting. So I guess the book is for everyone now. Yeah, I think um, one of the things the book does so beautifully is it gives people a different perception in different words to use. Because, you know, when everyone around you is telling you you're supposed to be depressed and sad and you can't communicate, you believe you're depressed and sad and can't communicate and you're powerless. And your book just kind of you know, it, it opens up to like the yellow brick road and the adventure of what, what is possible and really looking deeper at the heart and the brain and, and just the movement, the whole, the whole piece. It, it's just, it really is quite, quite beautiful. I want to add, because you mentioned the word communicate and that was probably the key issue. And I never realized it till you just said it right now is the communication part there was just other ways of communicating that I was surprised about. And even in gibberish, there was just a way of not, of listening to it, of actually listening to it. This next podcast I'm doing, by the way, and it's for Thanksgiving, is about another form of communication. My mother and I would went through this series of winking and the, the, what went on in that communication and it was winking in a restaurant and what it caused the communication of everyone around which I found if I, if I was being judgmental and I, I would create, I, I'd have a different outcome or there would be a different outcome. But the fact that you have to stop and pause and go, oh, wait, what's going on here? Or listen with your eyes and your body and every form of you, something happens that's different. And communicating is pretty major when it comes to dementia there. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it forces us, well, it doesn't force us, it gives us a choice to go broader and deeper or stay shallow and isolated. And, you know, it, that's just such a, such a big, big thing. When you're talking about winking in the restaurant, um, I, I kind of, it made me chuckle thinking, well, I can see people thinking, what are they doing? What are, what are they, and, and that's contagious, that, that positivity, that joy. Um, that curiosity. And I think that's what's so important about sharing stories is giving people hope of being able to do it another way. And, and I'm a firm believer, and I think you are as well, that, you know, once you step into dementia land, your whole other world changes because your perceptions of how you interact with others changes too. And you realize you've got that power. I, I just think it, I, I think it's here to teach us so, so many beautiful lessons. Now, when we were in California and we were chatting away and you were like, you know, I asked you, what do you want to do next? And you're like, I, you know, I really want this to be a film. So tell how you met Radic, because this happened so fast. I'm thinking, man, this, this woman is like the, the, the good witch on, um, <laughs> on the Wizard of Oz, because it was like, whoom, it just took off so fast and, um, and it happened. So, so tell that story of how the two of you met. Well, I'll just give the introduction and then I'm going to let Radic take it from there. Was <laughs> A friend of mine said, let's go. Why don't you go to the American film market with me? And um, 
he was he was producing something else and I says okay I'll go so um and I'm looking and there's a event happening at that time and it was um I think a pitch event and a pitch see I'm not even familiar with the terms it's a pitch event and that means that it's a pitch from book to movie so I went well I could see me doing this so you had to submit these little videos of only two minutes or three minutes and explain what you have in mind so I did it here in my studio with a stupid little camera it didn't look professional at all and um, I submitted it and um, when I was there I heard I was accepted and they wanted to hear my what I had to say so I had to give this pitch in front of Oh, the room was filled with producers and directors. And there was, I forgot, 10 of us who actually had to do it. And I was excited. I I can imagine. And that's when I met at the end, I had a couple producers come up to me, but Raddick came up to me and Raddick asked for my book and I gave it to him and um, he read it and he says, I'll meet with you tomorrow morning. And he says, this is, I love what you're doing. It sounds like a, it sounds like a Fellini movie. I adore Fellini. So it was like, oh my God. It's, I just looked at him like he was God. This is it. This is it. And he read my book. We met the next morning and there were tick marks. He had post-its. He read every single page in that book and, and, ticked, and had comments all through the entire thing. I was, I have never seen this. And it was like, I, I think he, he, he loved the writing and I think he loved the message. <laughs> so Laurie, you were, you were uh, speaking about the Suska experience that you got. Um, I had it as well. And I had it during the American film market. And, you know, it's as Suska describes, I asked her for the book. And then I went back to my hotel and started reading the book. And uh, I read part of it in the room and part of it in the lobby. And, you know, it, it made me la like laugh and laugh out loud at several places. And it also made me cry and, <laughs> and literally cry. So I was sitting in the lobby and, you know, laughing and then at some point crying. So I had people coming up to me and asking, you know, sir, are you all right? Do you need any help? Can we help you? <laughs> I was like, no, no, thank you. <laughs> it's the book. So, um, yeah, you know, I weirdly... I felt home in the book. The book felt like home to me. I immediately, you know, I maybe it's partly because, you know, I'm from Poland, um, grew up Catholic, um, certain, certain cultural references, of course. Then the whole notion of the book being, you know, magical realism, a very, very strong form of magical realism, which is something which is very close and dear to my heart. So I immediately knew that I wanted to, to do it. Now, of course, it's not it's not uh, that simple, but you know, the first step was trying to convince Suska that you know I'm the right person uh, for the right job at that time, and and luckily she had you know luckily we we hit it off immediately very very well, and we had some really common ground, and and I mean Suska, you've been you you came over to Germany twice in uh, in uh, you know those socks that you brought from Mexico. <laughs> Uh, and and you know we started because because one of the things that was interesting for me you know of course the book is the book but when you're adapting to screen when you're adapting to a movie it's um you know you you start thinking about other things as well you know you know you, of course you have your traditional arcs character arcs and you know your protagonist the antagonist yada 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 and everything but one of the things when you adapt from a book which is almost as interesting as the book itself is sometimes the scenes that didn't make it into the book. Because, you know, when, when you're constructing your character arcs, you, you, you very carefully want to see what, what, is, what is the theme and what is the transformation of this character and maybe what other things are there that didn't land in the book. So that, that was, you know, we did a lot of that. And I, I you know, I, I, I almost pestered Suska at times, you know, um, about the relationship between her and her mother, you know, asking questions that I would typically, typically ask when I, when I'm creating a character, when I'm creating a backstory for the character. So, um, yeah, but, you know, luckily, luckily, uh, we both think that we're the right people for the right job. And, um, I'm going to make this into a movie. 
was a lot of therapy going on for me. <laughs> with that constant, he would ask me, he would, I would, we would work during the day, then he'd leave me alone, you know, he'd go to his own apartment and I'd have to write and work at night. And it was like, and then he'd come back the next day and it was like therapy. I had to, he dragged things out of me. It was great. And the socks, by the way, I, I knew I was going over to Berlin, so it was cold. I went in January. Oh, my God. So I went to Tijuana and bought all these socks. But the socks that I bought, they were black and they were falling apart. And when he'd come in in the morning, there was these black little cotton dots all over his apartment. He said, what in the hell is that? I went, oh, my God, my socks are falling apart. So it was, it was hysterical. Too funny. Um, Radek, I want to ask you, why do you think it's important this time, you know, to bring this story to life, it just in terms of where society is? Did that come into the picture in terms of where, where you think needs are and, and where the film industry is going? Absolutely. Maybe not from an, you know, industry standpoint, simply from a story standpoint. I mean, you know, I could... We, we could talk about facts and statistics, and you know that much, much better than I do, that we have, you know, roughly around, um, supposedly around 50 million people worldwide suffering from dementia, which, you know, they are projecting that it's going to be 150 million by 2050, I think, if I read that correctly, plus all the people that are affected by these people and live with these people or care for these people. So, you know, aside from that... You always get excited as a, as, a, as a movie director and a movie producer when you come across a book or a topic that tells a story that is, you know, appealing and touches many, many people in a way that it hasn't been told before. And that was the one thing that Suska managed to do with her book. And I think that every one of us would, would, would agree on that. You know, it was like... I always compare it to Roberto Benigni's La Vita Bella, you know, life is beautiful. When for the first time you had the topic of the Holocaust to told in a very, very different way um, that before of that would, you know, have been a bit of a taboo maybe, or, or people have said, well, you can't tell the story that way. Well, yes, you can, as it turns out. And I think what is very, very important is that is it is a story that, you know, a about dementia, about how you live and deal with dementia, which is told in a very, very positive way. And that's what is absolutely intriguing because people forget, and at times, you know, maybe I shouldn't say it that way because it's, you know, I'm not directly caring for anyone, but there is joy in things. And Suska found so much joy in those, you know, in, in, in those four years that she was caring for her mother, that it completely blew me away. And this is, you know, sometimes you'd simply have a feeling this is a story that must be told. It not, it's not that it could be told or should be told, it must be told. Because I think that there's an audience out there which is yearning for that kind of story. Oh, I, I totally agree. And film captures people in, a, in an innocent fashion and they get wrapped up in the story and, and it lives on beyond the moment of just viewing it. And I think that's what her book you know, does as well in her podcast. It, it makes people look at, and perceive things differently, looking at possibilities of goodness instead of this doom and gloom that we've been pitched because that's how, that's how corporations raise money. You know? scare yeah. the bejesus out of us and they'll give money and and i you know i come from the attitude of give them hope and they'll stick around you know <laughs> and they'll they'll help you share that story I, I just think it's it's very very important what types of challenges do you have you know adapting the book other than you know having to crack the whip you know with suska to get some other stories and stuff out of her but what 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 other challenges are there of getting a film made because this isn't something that just happens overnight i know that no and i think that you know suska for you it's it's it is at times uh you know you you're in a way in a positive way a very impatient person who you know being an artist you 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 just do things and in the film world it doesn't work that way you you know you need to develop a screenplay you need to finance a film which takes quite a long time at 
at, at, at times. And, but, you know, aside from the challenges that you, obviously you need to get everything from the screenplay over the actors, over the money, um, every story has its different challenges. And this story is challenging for two reasons, or maybe three reasons. Um, one of it is that it is partly, you know, there's there are several timelines in the story. We have at least three timelines in the book, which is, you know, the present. We have the timeline of Chicago in the 60s, and we have the timeline of Chicago in the 50s. So that already is a challenge. But the much bigger challenge is that we have this whole magical realism um, uh, timeline, which is, or not timeline, but 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 room, um, where you need to figure out how you're going to film that. And, you know, the question why now is that only now are we at a point in, 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 in the film industry, in the movie industry, where certain tools that allow you to create scenes of magical realism have become more affordable for, you know, not only mega productions like Marvel movies or, you know, DC Comics movies, but to other filmmakers as well. And this is something that is absolutely crucial for the story because, you know, as a filmmaker, you need to find out how, how am I going to film a scene which starts in the room of Violet, but then turns out into this, you know, magical fantasy room, dementia land. How do you film that? Because it's easy to... It, don't get me wrong, it's not easy to write that, but in a way it's easy to write that. It's much harder to actually recreate that audiovisually. So I would say those are the major challenges. Well, and that, and that makes sense. And I think that those challenges are gonna, you know, make it even more beautiful to see um, because it's just, it's just gonna, it's going to morph us as as um, viewers into this world, especially nowadays with big screen and just er, er, you know the way everything happens. I mean, it's it's just interesting. I mean, I, I can even see we're in three D glasses with this one in terms of what what else happening going on uh, around you. Now, Suska, what what would you like the time frame to be? And then I'm going to go back to Radic of what is realistic. <laughs> Oh, no, I've gotten much more patient and, 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 you know, things always happen when they're supposed to happen. So I kind of agree that this is the time to start to, well, I think of it more of a, a political, emotional and, and sociological time that this is, this is perfect. But, but I have become more patient in understanding that things do take time. But it, it just seems like it's, it's just so needed. Well, and I think one of the things too with this time has allowed you to develop, you know, the podcast and share other stories as well and kind of add to the, mu um, the magic. And then also just being able to spread your work, you know, letting people see it in different forms. So now you've got a book, you've got a podcast, all of those things will build on your your audience so when it's ready to roll you know it, and it's sometimes i know can feel like a, a small build but those numbers add up over time and word spreads um radic up for you what are you thinking realistically you know a time frame would be i know covid's probably just shot you in the foot and you know all over the place really within terms of you know trying to forge forward because no one knows really what's going on, how long this is gonna last. It's definitely impacted the film industry as we've all seen and just the, the viewership of, of how things are delivered. So what are you looking at? And I know timelines will change, so I'm not gonna hold you to it, but what, what are your thoughts in terms of being able to raise the funds and, and move forward or have you started or are you still scripting things out? Two things are actually, Let's let's come back after I answer that question to your virtual reality remark because we have something in petto there as well. Um, so in terms of timeline, I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. COVID basically, you know, all bets are off at this point, and not only because it's very very difficult to produce, and it's very dif difficult to produce for one simple reason. I mean, other than that, everyone can get COVID. You can't insure against COVID at least not here in Europe and Germany, which puts production companies in a huge gamble if they risk it. 
because you know unless you're a huge production company uh, or a studio of the likes of you know Netflix Amazon one of the majors um, where you can spread the risk amongst many um, many productions it's it's difficult to shoot right now um, now luckily for us we're at a financing stage. So we're actually, we, we have a script and we're taking the next step, which is um, two-faced, which, is, which means that we are uh, trying to get the funding together here in Europe. And we are also delivering a proof of concept for one of the scenes. Now, what I mean by that is simply showing potential financiers that were capable of, you know, technologically transitioning from a realistic scene to to this magical realism and what it's going to look like. I mean, it's 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 basically what Peter Jackson had to do to convince, you know, the big studio to let him um, film the Lord of the Rings. Um, and I don't mean that as a direct comparison, but it's you, you need to do for oh. some things you need proof of concept. So that's the stage that we're at. So realistically speaking, at this point, I think that by the second half of 2022, so not the next year, but the next year after that, we'd be uh, ready to shoot that. And it would require, you know, a large part of it to be shot in Europe, in Germany, but that's okay because a large part of it is a studio shoot anyways. And then some of the scenes which are outside, where obviously if you're telling California at some point, you need to show California and you need to show Chicago. So that part would be shot in America. But so, so that's the timeline that I'm thinking about. And the other thing that I wanted to say uh, is uh, something that... Uh, an answer to your remark about the virtual reality and also to Suska saying that sometimes you need to wait for things uh, so the time is right for things. And one of the things that we're also planning, because, you know, nowadays it's almost not enough to bring, to have just a movie, you know? It's so difficult. You're competing against so many other um things that are crying for our attention and you know all of us just have 24 hours so that that's the only thing that doesn't change so it's sometimes it's not enough to just have the movie you know you need uh, luckily we have a book um but you need other experiences to go with it and one of the things that we're planning is something not with virtual reality but with augmented reality and artificial intelligence which sort of lets you as the viewer get a little bit into the, you know, into, into the visual experience of what Suska describes in her book. And not in the movie, but in your everyday life when suddenly, you know, gypsies appear and start dancing and you hear music. And that's only become possible as the technology has, has advanced. So that's, that's one of the things that, that I'm also very excited about because, you know, it, it, it opens a whole world of dementia land things that, we are, that we're trying to get out there. Wow, that's amazing. And, you know, in terms of that, are you looking at that would be something that, you know, with the, so just so I'm clear, that with mm -hmm. the goggles and things that you put on and you're in seeing that, is that, am I going down the right path with that? Yes, but the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality, I mean, virtual reality is where you put in the goggles and you can't see your surrounding anymore. Augmented reality is, you know, I'll give you an example, Microsoft HoloLens or the new Apple glasses that are supposed to, supposedly coming out is glass like this or a little, little bit bulkier where you see your surrounding, but you see things and hear things within your surrounding. And one of the things that I'm very, very excited about is that it's not only... Um, useful for us in a store from a storytelling point of view but think of the therapeutic possibilities that there are out there when you you know bring augmented reality into the game you know for people with dementia for people with alzheimer's when they can you know when they can i'll give you a simple example so, you know sometimes the next relative lives a thousand or two thousand miles away so you can only see him or her on a screen if you're lucky but if you put on the glasses and have the technology behind it it's almost as he or she is sitting next to you now of course it's not like the real thing but it's a whole lot better than just you know skyping or zooming for that matter so i think there's a lot of therapeutic uh, possibilities in there 
Wow, that sounds really cool. And and technology is just changing so yeah. fast. I, and I think of different movies and, and how creative they've gotten in terms of everyone's just in awe of, you know, everything from, uh, from the costume design to, you know, being able to fly and roll and do so many things. And I think of your balloon heads, you know, going around and, uh, and just the characters that, that you have developed, you know, and the different, the different voices and things It would just, it really would make it even more magical if you could deliver on that, on that level as well. And I think it would be great um, too, from even a mental health standpoint, you know, we don't understand people who hallucinate or have psychotic episodes and, and things, and not that that's necessarily dementia, but people do get delusional and they do hallucinate sometimes and they see things maybe that aren't there that would give us a little better impression of what they might be experiencing if it's joy or or if it's fearful and just realizing hey i know it's not real but it sure feels real you know and i, I think that would give people a whole different impression of of what is going on um Gosh, are you looking at doing, um, and I know this is really early, are you looking at just kind of big screen experiences or, you know, Netflix and Hulu and everything has kind of blown up um, where people would be able to do this in their home? Or is that just way too early to tell? It's ideally it's going to be both. So, you know, again, COVID has derailed pretty much everything. There's a lot of, you know, cinemas, a lot of companies that that are involved going bust right now. Um, I personally also don't believe that we will have the viewing numbers in cinemas coming back to the extent that we had uh, before COVID. We shouldn't kid ourselves. At the same time, you know, you can't just start lamenting and wailing. That doesn't get you anywhere. So you have to think about different paths and different distribution methods. So yes, very much so. And, you know, ideally, of course... Um, what you would wish for as a filmmaker from the point of view to get it to as many people as possible is a worldwide deal with somebody like uh, uh, Amazon or Netflix or, you know, Disney plus or any one of the large ones out there. So yes, that's something that we are very much aiming for. And I, I would like to also say one thing because I, I, you, you said it beautifully just a moment ago, you know, I think that it's so absolutely zeitgeist and so absolutely needed for us, and I, it, it doesn't matter whether it's in the United States or whether it's in Europe, you know, to a certain degree, we're all facing the same problems, um, is the willingness and the ability of trying to look at things through another person's eyes, however strange that may be for you at the beginning. Because if we stop doing that, then we stop living together as a society. Yeah, so, and, and we're seeing kind of that happen right now, some of the, you know, what, what is happening in the world and how split we've become. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I, my heart just is like pounding for you. I'm just so excited for this project because I think it is really going to affect so many people in such a positive, positive light. And the other thing that I love about it is, you know, sometimes, especially with dementia, parents and grandparents get really protective of their kids and grandchildren. This will be intergenerational because this will be, you know, a fun, you know, um, experience really for all because it's tapping into that imagination, that creativity. And I think that is one of the things that holds us back and makes us feel stuck and isolated and powerless. And when we can tap that creativity and go, Hey, I got nothing to lose. Let's try this. Let's try this mode. And then when you try it, you just kind of go, wow, I, you know, I never would have taken that path. I never would have thought that would have worked, but it gives, per, it gives people permission to try something different, look at it from a different angle, experience it different. And then, you know, last is, which I think is the most powerful of all is giving people hope. And when they're hopeful, just like when they're scared, they share. 
And, you know, this compassion and these authentic voices come saying, my journey might be different than yours, but it's important. And I think you might be able to learn something from it. And you know what? You, I might be 10 steps ahead of you, but I can still learn something from your journey. And it just gets that, it gets people um, evolved and comfortable in a safe space to share. And I think that's where the, the learning and the transitions really, really come from. And it's also, if I may just add one thought, and I'm curious whether you perceived it as well, Laurie, the same way when you were reading the book, it's liberating. And it's, it's, I'll, I'll just read one sentence to you, which, which is one of the most important sentences that I, I heard Suska um, say, which is the quote, I learned to see my mother with my eyes opened and not contained by her motherhood or my ego. I didn't let my mother's motherhood get in the way of knowing who she really was. Now that is liberating. That is emancipating. That is, you know, that is stripping off all the things that we piled upon ourselves during this crazy journey that we call life and just letting go of that. Yeah. And that is a very strong universal message. Yeah. Letting go of those, those roles and the expectations we were told those roles were, or, or um, just with any family, you have all different kinds of family dynamics and to be able to just go, okay, you know, so I was the black sheep of the family when I was younger. I'm not today. You know, see me for who I am and I will see you for who you are as a whole person, knowing none of us were or ever will be perfect, but that we can still love deeply and, and care immensely for one another. You know, I'm going to add a little bit too, is this time with the COVID, something happened in the last six months and it wasn't all negative. People are communicating different. They're opening up different. They're, I mean, we're learning how to Zoom now. We're learning, I mean, this is a Zoom meeting. This is bizarre. And the minute people start realizing, oh my God, I can do things and think a little different. And they're, they're not only that, but they're talking to people on the other side of the world. And, and COVID has brought it more to a peak than anything else. People are getting tech savvy. I mean, so this is the timing of this and the timing of just talking about dementia is, is perfect. So I, COVID really has brought us quite a bit farther, advanced us, I think, in this uh, new form of communication, which is important. I think it's forced us to look at our relationships because what else, what else is there? You know, people are stuck at home together that a lot of times didn't spend a lot of time together and they're getting back to kind of that, that humanness, that the beauty of the simple things that are so important. I was watching the, um, I don't know, Country Western Awards and they, the night before the entertainers were talking about it. And, you know, they, they were all saying they were going through a lot of the same things, the isolation and the sadness and the loss but they all talked about the beauty of the connections of being able to be home with their child and go golfing or, um, you know, read a book or go for a walk or whatever it might be where, when they were on the road, they missed that. And, mm -hmm. and realizing the preciousness of our relationships and how that fills us. And I think you know, overall society, we've gotten so fast paced and so out of balance with, with our relationships and our work and our busyness, thinking that that's more important than the depths of who, who we are to one another and how we treat one another. And, you know, your book, um, your, your podcast, and then with the film coming, will just really bring that to light the, the simple joys and it doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be complicated in fact once you let go like you had said in the beginning you felt a lot lighter you know a lot of the burdens are gone of the old beliefs and you're just able to be in that moment and and recognize the beauty within that um it, it's it's amazing so Scott, i want you to talk a little bit about the podcast and where you're at with that and, um, you know, how, 
how you're putting those together because they're just, you gotta, you gotta go and, and follow her on her podcast, because if you are feeling down, you will be lifted on every single one of them. I mean, they're just visually and, you know, the voices and the tones and the stories, they just, they melt together so beautifully. And um, they really, they just hook you in, in a really, really good way. How's that process been for you? Well, I've learned quite a bit just, um, just with doing it. Uh, you, one thing is writing, but actually saying it out loud in, in, a, in a podcast, you have to change everything. So it's, I'm almost rewriting um, some of the verbiage and some of the words, and I'm a visual person. So it started with um, basically images um, with my words in it. And I, I love doing them. You don't, even though the, it's in relative, some kind of order, you can go ahead and listen to pick anyone and, and listen to them. Um, I try to keep them to 15 minutes because people are busy and 15 minutes, that's it. So they're, they're nearly all under 15 minutes. And it, it puts you through different, different parts of the book. Um, of course, there's a major part of the book that I'm not going to reveal because it's too cool and it should be for the movie. But there's so many stories and some stories that didn't make it into the book um, are in the podcast. And um, it's a social media time and people are home alone and, and they need to sometimes just take 10 minutes, have a cup of coffee and listen to it. I know a friend of mine says um, it's her shower thing. She listens to it in the shower. She picks it up and that's what she does every morning. So um, they are twice a month. Um, they were first once a week and then the visuals got definitely more complicated and I just got carried away with the visuals. So you can find it on YouTube and it's Dementia Land. And it's on every other podcast network, I think it is. Um, but the other podcast is just the vocal. But even the vocal is just, I, I love doing it. So I, well, it definitely shows, um, you know, because you can tell, uh, you can just feel the passion and the compassion through, through your storytelling, through the book, through the podcast. And I'm sure that will really be fun to have that. Um, through the film as well. And I just, I wish you guys the best of luck. I want to be there at the premiere. I'm telling you. Consider just, yourself invited. <laughs> I'm just so excited about this. I think it's, it's going to be life-changing for so many people. I brought a film around called A Timeless Love and we would do little talkbacks and stuff. And people would say, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know how that's going to work. And um you know, I don't know if they'll do a talk back or be engaged and people just, they melt, they just melt away and they tell stories that they haven't told anybody to perfect strangers after viewing. I mean, it just, it pulls them in. And I think, I know, I don't even think, I know your, your story is going to be so capturing, just like I experienced with this one film where we were showing it and it was in a room that didn't darken. <laughs> That's not too good with a film, a 90 minute film. And I remember going up to the event planner, you know, because I had said, you know, that's part of my requirements that I have in my contract and stuff for that. And they said, we're so sorry, we, we just didn't realize that we couldn't shut this down. So people literally could not see the film it was a white faded screen and I went up to the to the planner and I said you know I can switch this over I can I can jump into a program not a problem and he he just leaned back in his chair I'll never forget this moment and he said look at them they are totally engaged because it was so well written and I can I mean just with your podcast as a base you don't have to necessarily see the imagery because the storytelling is so powerful, but you add that to it and it's just off the charts, just off the charts. And so I can't wait to, 
to see that. And that might be, and, and I don't know if films ever do that. I know they do it with their music tracks, but maybe there's possibility of doing it as an audio for people just to listen to as well, if they're a runner or in the car um, to be able to hear the story. I would encourage you to maybe it is, it is an It is an audio on, um, on all the other podcast youtube is the only one that has the visuals but i'm saying for the big for the big screen film oh, i see having oh. having an option like that might be really really interesting because so many people are tapping into that um, or maybe you just and maybe you have and i don't know do it do an audio book for for what you have just because i know you guys don't have enough to do just thought i'd throw <laughs> it out there <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's it's definitely an idea worth thinking about. You know, I just weirdly enough, you said it now. I used to have a fellow in school when a long, long, long time ago, he put all the James Bond movies he had on tape, and he would listen to them in the evening. Mm -hmm. Not kidding. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe. It's another platform to get it out. And I mean, you think of how many people read books, and then a lot of them like to listen to it as well and watch the film. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's just, it's pulling people in in different ways. And chances are they're going to go, well, now I want to see how it is. How does it compare to this? How does it compare to that? Always thinking I'm a brainstormer. <laughs> Spin in the wheels, spin in the wheels. So, so Scott, how can people get a hold of you? Um, you want to give out an email? Um, yes, it could be Zuska, S-U-Z-K-A, at DementiaLand.com, or through YouTube, add a comment and please subscribe, or any of the others. Um, there's and also DementiaLand.com, and there's Zuska.com. And what about Facebook? Do you have a Facebook page? Yes, and it's dementia land. And Radic, how about you? What what would be the best way for people to to reach you? Oh, definitely the website. So it's www.magical-realist.com. Okay. And and the email is very simple because it's just mail at magical-realist.com. Okay, good. And his minus is the same as we call it a dash. <laughs> so just, just, just so people yes. know. <laughs> so www.magical-realist.com. God, oh. that's hard. <laughs> well, I, again, I can't thank you guys enough for your time. Your, your energy and your presence is just lovely. And I know this project is going to be a magical gift to the world. And I can't wait to see it, see it come to life. So thank you. Thank you, Lori, and thank you for having us.